Chapter 21 Down on the dry red world of Cacrafoon, in the middle of the vast rudlit desert, the stage technicians were testing the sound system. That is to say, the sound system was in the desert, not the technicians. They had retreated to the safety of Disaster Area's giant control ship, which hung in orbit some 400 miles above the surface of the planet, and they were testing the sound from there. Anyone within five miles of the speaker silos wouldn't have survived the tuning up. If Arthur Dent had been within five miles of the speaker silos, then his expiring thought would have been that in both size and shape, the sound rig closely resembled Manhattan. Risen out of the silos, the neutron phase speaker stacks towered monstrously against the sky, obscuring the banks of plutonium reactors and seismic amps beneath them. Buried deep in concrete bunkers beneath the city of speakers lay the instruments that the musicians would control from the ship. The massive photon adjutar, the base detonator, and the mega-bang drum complex. It was going to be a noisy show. Aboard the giant control ship, all was activity and bustle. Hot Black Desiato's limo, limo ship, a mere tadpole beside it, had arrived and docked, and the lamented gentleman was being transported down the high-vaulted corridors to meet the medium who was going to interpret his psychic impulses onto the Agitar keyboard. A doctor, a logician, and a marine biologist had also just arrived flown in at phenomenal expense from Maximeglon to try to reason with the lead singer, who had locked himself in the bathroom with a bottle of pills and was refusing to come out till it could be proved conclusively to him that he wasn't a fish. The bass player was busy machine-gunning his bedroom, and the drummer was nowhere on board. Frantic inquiries led to the discovery that he was standing on a beach on Santraginus V, over a hundred light-years away, where, he claimed, he had been happy for over half an hour now and had found a small stone that would be his friend. <laughs> the band's manager was profoundly relieved. It meant that for the 17th time on this tour, the drums would be played by a robot and that therefore the timing of the symbolistics would be right. The sub-ether was buzzing with the communications of the stage technicians testing the speaker channels and it was this that was being relayed to the interior of the black ship. Its dazed occupants lay against the back wall of the cabin and listened to the voices on the monitor speakers. OK, channel 9 on power, said a voice. Testing channel 15. Another thumping crack of wa noise walloped through the ship. Channel 15, eh, OK, said another voice. A third voice cut in. The black stunt ship is now in position, it said. It's looking good. Gonna be a great sun dive. Stage computer online? A computer voice answered. Online, it said. Take control of the black ship. Black ship locked into trajectory program, on standby. Testing channel 20. Zayford leaped across the cabin and switched frequencies on the sub-ether receiver before the next mind-pulverizing noise hit them. He stood there quivering. What, said Trillian in a small, quiet voice, does sundive mean? It means, said Marvin, that the ship is going to dive into the sun. Sun, dive. It's very simple to understand. What do you expect if you steal Hot Black Desiato's stunt ship? How did you know, said Zephot, in a voice that would have made a vegan snow lizard feel chilly, that this is Hot Black Desiato's stunt ship? Simple, said Marvin. I parked it for him. Then why didn't you tell us? You said you wanted excitement and adventure and really wild things. This is awful, said Arthur, unnecessarily, in the pause which followed. That's what I said, confirmed Marvin. On a different frequency, the sub-ether receiver had picked up a public broadcast, which now echoed round the cabin. Fine weather for the concert here this afternoon. I'm standing here in front of the stage, the reporter lied, in the middle of the rudlit desert, and with the aid of hyperbinoptic lenses, I can just about make out the huge audience cowering there on the horizon all around me. Behind me, the speaker stacks rise like sheer cliff face, and high above me, the sun is shining away, and doesn't know what's going to hit it. The environmentalist lobby... <laughs> The environmentalist lobby do know what's going to hit it, and they claim that the concert will cause earthquakes, tidal waves, hurricanes, irreparable damage to the atmosphere, and all the usual things that environmentalists usually go on about.
but I've just had a report that a representative of Disaster Area met with the environmentalists at lunchtime and had them all shot. So, nothing now lies in the way of... Zaphod switched it off. He turned to Ford. You know what I'm thinking, he said. I think so, said Ford. Tell me what you think I'm thinking. I think you're thinking it's time we got off this ship. I think you're right, said Zaphod. I think you're right, said Ford. How, said Arthur. Quiet, said Ford and Zaphod. We're thinking. So this is it, said Arthur. We're going to die. <laughs> I wish you'd stop saying that, said Ford. It is worth repeating at this point the theories that Ford had come up with on his first encounter with human beings to account for their peculiar habit of continually stating and restating the very, very obvious. As in, it's a nice day, or you're very tall, or so this is it, we're going to die. <laughs> his first theory was that if human beings didn't keep exercising their lips, their mouths probably shriveled up. After a few months of observation, he had come up with a second theory, which was this. If human beings don't keep exercising their lips, their brains start working. In fact, this second theory is more literally true of the Belcerebron people of Cacrafoon. The Belcerebron people used to cause great resentment and insecurity among neighbouring races by being one of the most enlightened, accomplished, and above all, quiet civilizations in the galaxy. As a punishment for this behaviour, which was held to be offensively self-righteous and provocative, a galactic tribunal inflicted on them that most cruel of all social diseases, telepathy. Consequently, in order to prevent themselves broadcasting every slightest thought that crosses their minds to anyone within a five-mile radius, they now, they now have to talk very loudly and continuously about the weather, their little aches and pains, the match this afternoon, and what a noisy place Cacrafoon had suddenly become. Another method of temporarily blotting out the minds is to play host to a disaster area concert. The timing of the concert was critical. The ship had to begin its dive before the concert began, in order to hit the sun six minutes and 37 seconds before the climax of the song to which it related, so that the light of the solar flares had time to travel out to Cacrafoon. The ship had already been diving for several minutes by the time that Ford Prefect had completed his search of the other compartments of the black ship. He burst back into the cabin. The sun of Cacrafoon loomed terrifyingly large on the vision screen, its blazing white inferno of fusing hydrogen nuclei growing moment by moment as the ship plunged onward, unheeding the thumping and banging of Zaphod's hands on the control panel. Arthur and Trillian had the fixed expressions of rabbits on a night road who think that the best way of dealing with approaching headlights is to stare them out. Zaphod spun around wild-eyed. Ford, he said. How many escape capsules are there? None, said Ford. Zaphod gibbered. Did you count them? he yelled. Twice, said Ford. Did you manage to raise the stage crew on the radio? Yes, yeah, said Zaphod bitterly. I said there were a, bunch of, a whole bunch of people on board, and they said to say hi to everybody. Ford goggled. Didn't you tell them who you were? Oh, yeah, they said it was a great honor. That and something about a restaurant bill and my executors. Ford pushed Arthur roughly aside and leaned forward over the control console. Does none of this function, he said savagely. All overridden. Smash the autopilot. Find it first. Nothing connects. There was a moment's cold silence. Arthur was stumbling around the back of the cabin. He stopped suddenly. Incidentally, he said, what does teleport mean? <laughs> Another moment passed. Slowly, the others turned to face him. Probably the wrong moment to ask, said Arthur. It's just, I remember hearing you use the word a short while ago, and I only bring it up because... Where, said Ford Prefect quietly, does it say teleport? Well, just over here, in fact, said Arthur, pointing out a dark control box in the rear of the cabin. Just under the word emergency, above the word system, and besides the sign saying out of order. In the pandemonium that instantly followed, the only action to follow was that of Ford Prefect lunging across the cabin to a small black box that Arthur had indicated and stabbing repeatedly at the single small black button set into it. A six-foot square panel slid open beside it, revealing a compartment, which resembled a multiple shower unit that had found a new function in life as an electric electrician's junk store. Half-finished wiring hung from the ceiling, a jumble of abandoned components lay strewn on the floor, and a programming panel lolled out of the cavity in the wall into which it should have been secured. 
A junior disaster area accountant visiting the shipyard where this ship was being constructed had demanded to know of the works foreman why the hell they were fitting an extremely expensive teleport into a ship which had only one important journey to make, and that unmanned. The foreman had explained that a teleport was available at a 10% discount, and the accountant had explained that this was immaterial. The foreman had explained that it was the finest, most powerful and sophisticated teleport that money could buy, and the accountant had explained that the money did not wish to buy it. The foreman had explained that people would still need to enter and leave the ship, and the accountant had explained that the ship sported a perfectly serviceable door. The foreman had explained that the accountant could go and boil his head, and the accountant had explained to the foreman that the thing approaching him rapidly from his left was a knuckle sandwich. After the explanations had been concluded, work was discontinued on the teleport, which subsequently passed unnoticed on the invoice as Sund Explanates at five times the price. Hell's donkeys, muttered Zaphod, as he and Ford attempted to sort through the tangle of wiring. After a moment or so, Ford told him to stand back. He tossed a coin into the teleport and jiggled a switch on the low-ling control panel. With a crackle and a spit of light, the coin vanished. That much of it works, said Ford. However, there is no guidance system. A matter transference teleport with no guidance programming could put you, well, anywhere. The son of Cacrafoon loomed huge on the screen. Who cares, said Zaphod. We go where we go. And, said Ford, there is no auto system. We couldn't all go. Someone would have to stay and operate it. <laughs> a solemn moment shuffled past. The sun loomed larger and larger. Hey, Marvin, kid, said Zaphod brightly. How you doing? Very badly, I suspect, muttered Marvin. <laughs> Man, Marvin always gets the short end. A shortish while later, the concert on Cacrafoon reached an unexpected climax. The black ship, with its single morose occupant, had plunged on schedule into the nuclear furnace of the sun. Massive solar flares licked out from it millions of miles into space, thrilling and in a few cases spilling the dozen or so flare riders who had been coasting close to the surface of the sun in anticipation of that moment. Moments before the flare light reached Cacrafoon, the pounding desert cracked along a deep fault line, a huge and hitherto undetected underground river lying far beneath the surface gushed to the surface to be followed seconds later by the eruption of millions of tons of boiling lava that flowed hundreds of feet into the air, instantaneously vaporizing the river both above and below the surface in an explosion that echoed to the far side of the world and back again. Those very few who witnessed the event and survived swear that the whole hundred thousand square miles of the desert rose into the air like a mile-thick pancake, flipped over and fell back down. At that precise moment, the solar radiation from the flares filtered through the clouds of vaporized water and struck the ground. A year later, the 100,000 square mile desert was thick with flowers. The structure of the atmosphere around the planet was subtly altered. The sun blazed less harshly in the summer, the cold bit less bitterly in the winter, pleasant rain fell more often, and slowly the desert world of Cacrafoon became a paradise. Even the telepathic power with which the people of Cacrafoon had been cursed was permanently dispersed by the force of the explosion. A spokesman for disaster area, the one who had had all of the environmentalists shot, was later quoted as saying that it had been a good gig. Many people spoke movingly of the healing powers of music. A few sceptical scientists examined the records of the event more closely and claimed that they had discovered faint vestiges of a vast artificially induced improbability field drifting in from a nearby region of space. <laughs>